Um, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for showing up. So, oh god, no. Ah. Year is 1997. Um, the computer of IBM, Deep Blue, beats Gary Kasparov on the tournament uh, conditions in, I think, a six or seven game series. This is the first time ever that a computer has won against the premier human player, and Gary Kasparov is uh, considered to be one of the best players of all time in chess. At around the same time, um, in Computer Go, we had the tournament from 1985 to 2000, which was called the World uh, Cup, with a total prize of a million dollars if someone would be able to beat 10 to 14-year-old Chinese children that were Go protégés in an even game. So it was not for the lack of trying. Um, but in the same year, 1997, um, there was this tournament, and the winner of the tournament plays against these uh, Chinese so-called insays. And the program won, but by a huge handicap of, for those of you that know Go, I think 11 handicap stones, which is pretty much the difference of a very amateur player and maybe an intermediate player, so to say. So let's dig a bit more into the current history, uh, in the more recent history of Computer Go, and also in why is Go so hard to master as compared to chess? Why are we so much behind? This doesn't work? Okay. Uh, year is 2001. An anime by the name of Hikaru no Go uh, is launched in uh, Japan, revitalizing um, Go and making it more popular uh, among the youth. It has been going downhill in Japan uh, for some time uh, before that. But overall, it's very popular in Eastern Asia. Uh, so there are professional players that get paid to play. You can watch it on TV and everything. Year is 2009. Google invents a language called Go, saying, oh, there's a game that's like, what, 4,300 years old? Oh, we're just going to name Steamroll right over that old board game. And of course, uh, there's also another programming language by the name of Go, and they also just Steamrolled right over that, because what the hell, we Google, we can do whatever we want. Um, Year 2014, on the right you see uh, Rémi Coulon. Um, he's the programmer of a program called Crazy Stone, and it's one of the two strongest programs uh, that we have in Go. And he plays against uh, a professional that's called Yoda. He's a ninth down professional player. And Crazy Stone won with a handicap of four stones, uh, which is a lot less than the other handicap, but it's still uh, a real big difference in playing strength. Um, 31st of October 2015, in the Code-Centric Go Challenge um, between uh, the program Zen, which is one of the two most strongest programs, played in an even game against one of the strongest amateur of the world, uh, Franz Josef Dickhut, uh, a German 5 player. player. Um, uh, the, uh, the German, uh, the human prevails uh, in a five game, in a best of five series, three to one. Um, this is the last move played um, in that series. 3rd November 2015, Facebook publishes a blog post that's like, oh, we're doing all this cool machine learning stuff. And by the way, we wrote a Go engine. It's awesome. And we don't really tell you what we're doing exactly about pattern recognition. And their CTO did not answer my Facebook message uh, about what they're really doing, <laughs> quite to my surprise. Um, but we're going to get a bit into that and how, far, how strong that engine really is for all that we know. 13th November 2015, um, this site hits Hacker News. It says play Go against a deep neural network. And uh, we will also have a look at what's up with that, uh, what's the science behind um, this. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of stuff that is in scientific papers, but don't be afraid. It's all cool. And if you don't know Go, all cool. Uh, we're going to go over the uh, basics of Go shortly. So this talk is beating Go thanks to the power of randomness. Uh, hi, I'm Toby. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, GitHub, and everywhere else as Bragtop. Um, I'm out of Berlin, uh, all the way here. I organized the Ruby user group Berlin in Berlin, the React uh, uh, user group in Berlin. Um, I'm a Rails Girls coach. I do open source. I do shoes. Who knows shoes? Like, that's wee! Amazing stuff. Uh, yeah, and I work at a great company uh, called Bitcrow, which is an agency. Um, so we help startups uh, build things. It's lots of fun to work there. Right now, we're actually hiring. So if you want to relocate to Berlin, one of the best cities. Just saying, and they paid for me to go here, so pretty great. So 
Uh, some of you might be concerned uh, about my t-shirt because it's like, oh God, it's Yoda. Like, would Yoda allow him to wear the t-shirt of Yoda? Is, is, is that physically okay for him? I can tell you, you know, there's a saying that Superman wears like a um, Chuck Norris uh, t-shirt. So Yoda obviously wears a Toby t-shirt. So we, we're buddies, you know, we made that out. Um, so everything cool there. So continuing with the basics of Go. Um, Go is played uh, on a board uh, with lines in the sections, and the normal size is a 19 by 19 board. Uh, then we also have 13 by 13 and 9 by 9. Normal professional games are played on the 19 by 19 board, um, but uh, the 9 by 9 board is also still relevant and interesting. So how does Go go? Um, we start uh, playing move, black starts, and we play on an intersection. So that is now a black move, then white moves, Black, white, and whoa, too far, sorry. Um, that's the basic uh, thing. So taking further from that, a stone has so-called liberties. Uh, those are the adjacent um, cutting points that are empty. So this stone has four liberties. If I play another stone, uh, they form a group together and they have six liberties. When white plays uh, next to the black stone, both of these stones have three liberties because they take one liberty away from each other. So if white continues to play, now I have two liberties, and in the end, three liberties. And now we're in a state which is called Atari. And Atari's company name was really chosen by that name of that Go term. And Go term and that term means um, before capture, sort of. So if white plays another move, that removes the last liberty from the black stone, and that means the black stone is captured and taken off the board and counts as a point uh, for white. Of course, black isn't stupid. Uh, black knows how to play and can stretch out. So now black has uh, free liberties again, and it's all good. So I told you right now that there is a point um, which uh, white gains from the capture. So how do you win in the game of Go? The game of Go is basically about getting more territory than your opponent. You try to encircle territory and claim it uh, for yourself and then uh, territory is then one point of these intersections, and then in the end it is counted who made more territory. So it's basically a game of dividing. I try to get more of the cake uh, than my enemy does. So in this uh, example, we would have encircled one point, so that, we were, that would be one point for black. If we go further, white could now encircle uh, black, and now black is at one liberty, so we know what's probably gonna happen. White can capture, thereby making eight captures, so eight points, and of course this now also counts as white territory, so it's gonna be eight points of territory, so 16 points made here in total, which is pretty uh, much a lot on a nine by nine board. But uh, is, this, uh, is it an endless game of capture and recapture? No, because there's also something in the state that a group is alive, uh, so we say, and this is a typical group that it's alive, uh, it has two eyes, uh, which means we have two points of territory here, and um, white can simultaneously occupy both of those liberties, uh, because white, if white would play in there, it would be immediately recaptured, the so-called suicide move, which is forbidden under Japanese rules, but not under Chinese rules. Um, so this, gay, this group cannot be captured, and in the end, all of them are alive. So what does a game look like in the end? Um, this is the end position of a game played between a professional player and uh, one of the strongest uh, Go engine. I think it was Zen, but I'm not quite sure. And so how do we count that? Well, we remove the so-called dead stones uh, that have no chance to live and then count the territory. And this game was drawn, and if you see now, it doesn't look like a draw, like black has way more points. Why was the game a draw? Well. There's a concept called Komi, and which is a set of bonus points that white gets um, because black uh, makes the first move. And so this game uh, was a draw. So, but what does a real game look like um, on the 19 by 19 board? Um, this is the game, this is the first game between Franz Josef Likud and Zen this year. And you usually start to occupy the corners first. And we can't go through the full game, so I'll fast forward. And so we can sort of see how the game starts forming here. Um, like black claims sort of the lower right corner and the upper right corner. And there's also something very 
like for me, interesting going on that you cannot see the immediate value of in the uh, lower left corner. Black starts a bit like sort of a wall that faces uh, upwards, and that is called influence. It is a very difficult, uh, even for really good players, to see like who is ahead here and who is not. And if you see the game commentary, there's lots of discussion about like who is in a better position at this place. So you can imagine how difficult it must be for a computer to assess the current situation. The game moves on, we see more moves played, and even more moves played, and at this point I want to focus your attention to the lower right corner. And this looks, at the first look, uh, if you don't know, go, it looks like, okay, uh, black and white are battling it out out there. Um, unfortunately, that is not at all the case. Um, that black group is practically dead. It is still on uh, the board, but it only has two liberties left, right uh, down there, and so it can be captured at any moment. A Go engine that would have to play and understand this would have to co uh, would have to understand that this is not actually a not played out position, but those stones are actually lost. If we fast forward to the end of the game, we can see that eventually white did capture um, that black group, and there are lots more, many much more complicated uh, positions on the board that I would not be able to assess because those programs and the player played a much higher level than I do. Okay. Um, so now we count this game, and this game was the only game that Zen won, and that was by a margin of one and a half points. So when we talk about Go versus chess, um, what's the difference? In Go, you start building something. You start with an empty board, and you build. The stones don't move. They might get captured, but you can't move them. You don't flip them. You build something. You have to plan strategically ahead, like where do I want to be? Where do I want to stand uh, in my game? In chess, you go out and destroy, basically. Um, your goal is to destroy uh, the other uh, king, and so you get less and less of uh, what you really have. Um, when I first looked into this, uh, which was in 2010, uh, also an interesting concept came up, uh, the, con the concept of the difference between what is complex and what is complicated. Go is very simple at its heart. Uh, there is a set of formalized rules that are just 10 rules that basically define the game of Go, and I've taught you almost all of them uh, by now. And still, Go is very complex because there are many, many possibilities where I can play which results into many things that could happen, which makes Go very, very complex. On the other hand, chess is more complicated and complex. Chess has many rules. Which piece can move where? Like, then there's the rochade, and then at the first move, like, the pawns can move too. And so it's much more complicated of a game, and some of its uh, complexity stems uh, from it being so complicated. So uh, this is a quote by Edward Lasker, who is a chess, uh, who was a chess grandmaster, and he discovered Go a bit later in his life. And he said, while the Baroque rules of chess could only have been created by humans, the rules of Go are so elegant, organic, and rigorously logical that if intelligent life forms exist elsewhere in the universe, they almost certainly play Go. So, uh, when we want to talk about how strong programs are, um, I'm going to quickly introduce you to the ranking system uh, used into Go. Um, you consider the beginner uh, when you're at 30Q, which is basically you learn the rules and you play your first game. Uh, so that's 30 to 20Q. A casual player, you can become after maybe a couple of months uh, of play, or if you're really hardcore, then maybe in the first uh, week or so, then you're between 19Q and 10Q. The intermediate amateur uh, is from 9Q to 1Q, and it's very different what people say. Like, if you look at a Go wiki, they say, oh, you can reach that in a month. Um, I don't think so. Um, if you look at computer Go papers, uh, they, may, they mostly say, oh, well, it takes an amateur uh, a player years to reach that level, but I think they just say that to make their programs look stronger when they, re when they reach the Q level. Um, and then there's also the advanced amateur and the professional. Um, now, for a quick show of hands, uh, who has already played Go? Like, who at least reached the beginner state? Okay. At least reached casual player? Intermediate amateur? Okay. Advanced amateur? Oh god, there are people here that were much better at Go than me. Like I, <laughs> um, I, I didn't play. I don't play actively that much anymore. But I was around an AQ, so a weak intermediate amateur. It took me about one and a half years to go there, despite like playing tournaments and online and everything. So um, you might talk to me while I said wrong about some of the positions later on. <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Uh, why am I showing you this? Uh, it also gives you a hint of what uh, the worth of those handicap stones is, because in the amateur level, it is considered the difference of one handicap stone between, um, uh, between the ranks. So when a 9Q plays against a 5Q, the 9Q gets a handicap of four stones, which then looks like this. Uh, the stones are already placed, so uh, black essentially gets uh, four free moves. Um, so this is the handicap at which um, Crazy Stone won in 2014. Um, this is a handicap of uh, nine stones. That is like the highest handicap that you give in official uh, games at tournaments, um, as far as I know. And this is the handicap at which uh, one of the strongest Go programs lost in 1998 to the strongest uh, uh, to the Chinese and say the 10 to 15 year old uh, children. This is um, a handicap of 13 stones. I played once at that handicap at a blitz team tournament. Uh, we were around 10Q and we played against the team of Dan players. And this handicap is just unfair. Uh, so we bet the Dan level players, uh, although making very, very bad mistakes. And we were the only team to beat the, to beat the team of Dan players. They went on to win the tournament. So that shows you how unfair that handicap is. This is a handicap of 29 stones, which is just, I don't know, if you just picked up Go and played on the 19 times 19 board against me, you would most certainly win, most certainly. Um, in 1998, a German 5 Dan player bet the strongest Go uh, program at that handicap. And that was one year after Kasparov was defeated. So that's just meant to show you how far the programs were behind. So why is Go so hard? What makes it that much more complicated and difficult uh, than chess? So at first, we have a much, much larger board. Our board is 19 by 19 as opposed to just 8 by 8 uh, for chess. Then almost every move is legal. Like, as I said, I told you almost all the rules. I left out the co-rule, but basically, you have to move inside the field. You can't move at a place where somebody else already is. and then you can't play co-moves and not the so-called uh, suicide moves, and that's it. Um, so that leads to a very high average branching factor. What is an average branching factor? If you have, it's basically the average number of moves that are legal at any point uh, in the game. So for Go, we have 250, and chess, just uh, 35. We also, have a, we also have a very high state space complexity. State space, state space complexity is the number of valid board positions uh, that exist, and I think some mathematicians um, calculated those. So for Go, it's two to the power of 171, and chess 10 to the, uh, did I say two? 10 to the power of 171, and for chess, it's uh, 10 to the power of uh, 47. So those are huge numbers. What does that even mean? the number of atoms in the observable universe is estimated to be around 10 to the power of 80, which sort of means that we could take each of these atoms and make a combination with also all of the other atoms and have that as a combination list, which would turn out to be 10 to the power of 160 um, possible combinations, if my math doesn't fail me, and that would still be less um, than uh, the number of valid Go uh, positions. So at this point, you might get like a sense of the scale, uh, how big that problem is. And also, moves have a very global impact. You can't just go like, okay, I'm just gonna play locally here where my uh, enemy played last. That doesn't work uh, due to multiple reasons. Uh, one is, oftentimes, it's the best, it is the best move not to answer the move of your opponent, just play somewhere else, because the move somewhere else is much, much bigger. And the other thing is that a move that I play down here in the bottom right ha can have severe influences on a position to the top left. Uh, it might break things there and actually uh, defeat, um, decide the state of a group. So let's finally, after we got in our interim to go and why it is so hard, let's talk about artificial intelligence uh, for a second here. Um, this is an image uh, from Wikipedia of the alpha beta pruning or alpha beta search, which is one of the, which is the algorithm uh, basically uh, to play chess. Like Deep Blue used it, and I think uh, modern Go pro uh, modern chess programs uh, still use it. It's uh, a depth first search uh, in that graph where you go to leave, and then you have to evaluate the state of the board at that point in time because you can't play all the way to the end because even for chess that would be way too much um, to do. And then you 
almost you always assume perfect play, uh, which means uh, that's the min-max part. And the first move, that's our move, we try to maximize the value of the um, evaluation function to say like, okay, we want to have the best position for us. But that's the first step. And afterwards, it's the minimize because it's our opponent's move. And of course, our opponent is clever and will try to minimize the overall value of the evaluation function because your, our opponent wants to be a good move. And then we maximize and so on. So what's the problem here? Um, as I tried to show you before, it is very hard to write an evaluation function uh, for the game of Go. If you remember this uh, position, for instance, it's not very clear where territory will be of whom in the end and how much it will be. And there are other concepts involved, like Moyo and influence, that is like, okay, black has very much influence there, but white has more territory. That is something that you commonly hear in game commentary, and it's not easy to decide what is worth more and especially not for computers. So, so far we have been unable to find a good evaluation function. There's one uh, Go program called GNU Go uh, that uses alphabetical search, alphabetical pruning, uh, but it plays around the level of 5Q, 5-4Q, and current uh, strong Go programs play about the strength of a 5 10 or 6 10 um, amateur player. So, we came up with this great thing which is called the Monte Carlo method. So, um, to tell you what the Monte Carlo method is, I want to ask you a question first. Uh, what is pi? Like, what is the value of pi? 3.14 something, cool. So, how do you know that? How do you, how do you determine the value of pi? Come on, people. No one? Uh, don't. <laughs> so, so it's, it's some of circumference, blah, 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 math things. There, there, there is another way uh, to do this. Uh, you can uh, draw a, I think it's called union square uh, on a piece of paper and then do a circle in it and then you throw random pins at it and then you count how many pins land inside the circle, how many land outside of the circle, multiply that relation by four and then you get an estimation of pi, which is an example of the Monte Carlo method uh, applied and you can see it here. And right at the top, I think it's cut off, but you can see with the number of simulations, with the number of more random dots that we throw in there, um, our estimation of pi uh, gets better and better. Um, so this is the Monte Carlo method. Uh, it is, uh, pi is not its best use case, but it's usually used in spaces um, where it's very hard to do a full simulation of something. So we just do a random simulation, and in the end, we just assess what is the outcome and by running multiple um, random simulations and then assessing the outcome, we can get an estimate or a guess of what uh, the final value is. And in Go, that is basically our evaluation function. So this, like the Monte Carlo method was proposed before in 1993 uh, in a paper, but it was not made to work. It was not until the year of 2006 until um, the Monte Carlo tree search uh, was developed and successfully applied to Go, or was actually deployed, um, developed for um, Go. And at that year, um, the program that implemented Monte Carlo tree search also won the Go tournament. So ever since, all Go programs uh, that are successful uh, use Monte Carlo tree searches. So that was sort of a revolution, and it's been rather recent. Alphabeta search has been around since 1957 or something. So this is the basics of the Monte Carlo tree search. We go through a selection phase first to select the node we want to play at, then we do an expansion, then we do a random simulation, and afterwards we do a backpropagation of our results. So what does it look like in detail? Um, in this graph, uh, we say uh, each node um, has at first like the wins that have been at that node, and then last the visits, how many times have I visited that node. And the nodes represent a board state, and then afterwards, it's like we play a move, and then the next uh, node is like the board state that uh, results when we play that move. So at first, we go to the selection phase. We select the node we want to play it. We want to say, okay, we want to see here what happens here. We want to gain more information here. Then we do an expansion that says like, okay, uh, this is the move we're going to try here at that specific node. Then we're gonna do a random playout. And you might be right now, you might be like, okay, what random playout? Like, what, the, what are we doing? Like, it seems like not very smart uh, to do a random playout. But the hypothesis is this. Uh, if I'm standing better at the board uh, in general, if uh, I have a better position, 
if I do a random play out and I win in the end, like I'm more likely to win in the end if my position was uh, better. And if we do that lots and lots of times, we get a pretty clear view of is our position ultimately better or worse. So, and in the end, we do a back propagation that says, okay, we have one here, so we propagate that result uh, back uh, to the top. And here, you gotta be careful a bit, uh, if you remember the uh, min max. So, it's also a matter of perspective. So, up here, the sort of darkish thing is like the black move, and down here, it's the white move. And of course, we can't uh, do a back propagation that when white has won, then of course, black has not won, black has lost. And so you either have to take that into account during selection or how my GoBot does it and how I know other GoBots uh, do it is you always alternate how you, re how you report the results. So you say, okay, white won, then black lost, white won, black lost, white won, black lost. And so you always alternate uh, the result that you report so that the selection is uh, sort of uh, uniform. So let's talk about a, a bit about the selection because it's a crucial part. So we could just take like every move all the time and play each move equally uh, all of the time, but that's not very smart. And since we're already doing like the random play out stuff, we at least want to be smart about the selection, you know? And this is a so-called multi-arm bender problem, which is one of the most interesting problems I've uh, come across there. And it's that scenario, you're sitting at a casino and you're playing at those uh, bandits and you're playing at your machine and it's going good and you're like, okay, I make a lot of money, that's cool. Uh, but then you start wondering like, maybe one of these other machines yields better results. Maybe they give me more money. And that's sort of the thing that you want to balance also in the tree. Like you can't always play at the game, at the point where you're winning or where you think your winning percentage is best, but there might be another uh, node that might yield better results, but you were just unlucky, uh, unlucky, sorry, uh, so far there. So that is called exploitation versus exploration. Exploitation is like, okay, I'm playing at the node with the best winning uh, percentage, and exploration is like, okay, is there something else out there to try and balance uh, what we're doing? And for this, um, uh, the standard solution that uh, we use, uh, it's the upper confidence bound, or in uh, Go, it's UCT, the upper confidence bound applied to tree search, and this is the general formula. Um, and this value is calculated for every node to then uh, select which node we're gonna see. So we take the win percentage um, and then we add to that some sort of exploration factor that you can set uh, to your liking and there are multiple papers about like which is the best exploration factor, of course. And then you take the uh, square root of the logarithm, the natural logarithm of the total visits divided by visits. So that is sort to balance like if I haven't uh, visited a, a node uh, a lot, let's try and visit it again. So how does that work? Uh, this is like now a real example that I took from my uh, Go engine. Right now at the top here, the number is just number of visits because not enough space. So anyway, first selection, uh, we select this node because it has the best uh, winning percentage of all the nodes that we have right now. So I cut out lots of other nodes uh, to make it fit on the slide. But then uh, what's, what was interesting for me when I looked again into this is on the second selection, at least for the exploration factor that I use, we do not play on the free of free node that we would say that would be the exploitation. It's a node that's going good, we're gonna play there again. But it's like, okay, this node has like a pretty good win, win percentage, 50%, we haven't uh, visited a lot, so let's try playing there again. Let's try uh, what's happening when I play there. So at this point, uh, you might ask like, what are we doing here? This is not at all like human-like. Um, we're like, humans don't play like that. Humans don't go out and be like, okay, I start the game, so I'm just gonna play random moves in my head, and at the end I'm gonna count it perfectly, and then I'm gonna decide on that uh, how I play. Um, humans look for patterns. They look for like, how does the board look, and what would I normally play, and there's a lot of intuition involved a lot of times in um, human play. And I chose the picture because I wanna remind you of how humans Try to, try to fly in, I don't know, the 16th century. Uh, we try to imitate birds. We try to have feathers and fab our wings and fly, and that didn't work out quite well. And what we do right now is we have these huge, like much bigger than birds, uh, these huge metal cages with some wings that sort of resemble them, but not quite, and helicopters are even more different, and that works out better for us. Why does it work out better for us? Because we choose the strength of humans to build these mechanical things and we have our engines and everything, we use that and not what birds are good at. Similarly, in Go, um, 
We don't do what we are good at, but we're doing what machines are good at. They're good at playing random moves and then in the end counting the result perfectly and doing that lots and lots of times per second. So Go engines play, do like 50,000 of those playouts per second. Not mine because it's in Ruby, but um, the others, you know. <laughs> Um, so, what are the characteristics of this algorithm or the Monte Carlo tree search? At first, it is a heuristic, which means um, I've talked to you about it, and we're just playing random moves. We don't put, or we don't have to put any expert knowledge into it. So, all that we need to know is how do I generate a valid random move, which is basically what I teach any beginner if I teach them Go. I tell them, okay, this is valid, this is, you can do this, but not that. And uh, we have to teach it who has won. We don't even really need to teach, well, yeah, we have to teach him to score to figure out who has won, but we're only interested in who has won uh, in Go. And for me, that sort of blew my mind because it means that I can be like a bad uh, Go player and I don't have to know a lot of Go. I don't have to encode it into the machine. The machine really plays by itself. It figures out what is the best move by itself by just teaching, okay, this is valid, and then in the end you can see, have I won, have I lost. And that is really amazing because that way we're also not limited by human knowledge because the machine might at some time surpass us and think of moves that we could never think of uh, and otherwise we might limit it by our human knowledge or human assumptions uh, that are encoded into the game. Which means also that the Monte Carlo tree search is the go-to algorithm for general game playing which is a discipline that I did not know much about before, but it's basically tournaments where before you get like a rule set encoded in a file and then the engines have to play games that they never knew before. And due to that um, uh, characteristic of the Monte Carlo tree search that it does not need to know game specific knowledge, it's the go-to algorithm for general game playing as well. Also, the algorithm is any time. Uh, with the alpha beta search, it's a depth first search, so I always have to search through the whole tree until I can make my decision on the best move. With the Monte Carlo tree search, I can stop it at any time and say like, okay, this is a good enough move. Like, I can play um, this move. It might be really bad, um, uh, but I can do that, which is good if you're doing time management. And Monte Carlo tree search is lazy. This is my favorite paper about uh, about Monte Carlo, uh, so I have to tell you this. So imagine a game, uh, this is, game is called Double Step. It's stupidly simple. Um, in Double Step, you can make one move or two moves. Oops, too far. Oop. One move or two moves. And you win when you reach um, the end um, of uh, that thing. So it's pretty easy, you know? As a human, you say, okay, two moves is always the best move, you know? Um, so yeah, we win when we're at the end. So what does the Monte Carlo tree search do here now? And so on the top here we have the handicap. A uh, handicap of minus two means like um, I'm two steps behind. A handicap of two means okay, I get a handicap of two, I'm two steps ahead. On the left side we have the number of simulations, uh, of Monte Carlo simulations um, that I ran. So eight random player outs, 16 random player outs, uh, 32, 64, 100, etc. And what we have in the middle here is the percentage of that black for its first move uh, selected um, two steps. And so I ran this um, 10,000 times each um, for each of those and we see uh, the winning percentage here. So we can see at the bottom that we're doing pretty good if we do 100 playouts. Uh, we're at 99.8% or even at 100% if it's an even game. And we can see many characteristics here. So for instance, especially with the uh, lower playouts, so let's look at the first line, the eight playouts, we can see that when we're behind uh, by two, we only have a percentage of 86% uh, to pick the optimal move. Because that is, uh, Monte Carlo engines get sort of desperate. When they're behind by a lot, they play, they often play nonsense moves, especially also in Go. They play moves that's like, okay, here I play that, and then my opponent would have to, uh, to not answer that move for two or three uh, turns in a row in order for that to yield any value because they get really desperate. But what's even more interesting is the number in the bottom right. Um, as we get more handicap, as we uh, had more, our moves get worse, at least for the uh, 100 uh, playouts. So we just take the best move 98% of the time. And that's because uh, most Monte Carlo engines just care about if they're winning or losing. They're not caring about by much how, po how many points they win because that yields worse results as research uh, shows. And you can often observe that in play when a Monte Carlo bot that you're playing against is ahead by a lot, 
It will just play very, very safe moves according to the motto, better safe than sorry. And by the end, the GoBot uh, will win by maybe two points or something. You'll be like, oh, I almost bet that GoBot, yes. Uh, not at all. The GoBot was just, oh, I've won either way. So I'm not going to play these really safe moves because I don't care because I'm going to win either way. <laughs> so um, a move that sort of showcases this is the last move of the game that uh, Zen won against Franz Josef Dickert. Um, in the commentary and uh, also for every other, well, lots of other plays, that last move, it's marked with the X in the middle and also green highly highlighted now. Most human players consider that move unnecessary because it's pretty clear that that middle is fully black's uh, territory. There are some cutting stones, but there's not much danger um, coming from them. Nevertheless, Zen uh, still played there because why? Zen knew it was two and a half points ahead, so wasting a move in the other uh, in the territory, it was still one and a half points ahead, and it would still win. So it played better safe than sorry. So what are some of the enhancements um, that we can do um, to play better in the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm? Well, my favorite enhancement is all moves as first, and also has a variant which is called RAVE, uh, Rapid Action Value Estimation. And the basic idea is this. If we play random moves all the way out, all the time, then does it really matter in which order we play them? And no, it really doesn't if the, if the moves are few random. So here in the back propagation phase, when we propagate the result of the game back, we also look at all of our sibling nodes and look at if any of those nodes um, is a move that we made uh, at any point uh, during the game. And then we also update the win stats uh, for that move. What uh, the Rave algorithm then does is, it says like, okay, that's cool that we do that, but it's not the most accurate thing um, in the end. So it gives those extra moves that we update, uh, so the call of Armav wins and Armav wizards uh, for all moves as first, it gives them a diminishing value. So at first, uh, they're taken into account a lot during the selection phase, but when we reach like 2,000 Armav wizards or something, uh, then it ignores those values because uh, we fed uh, a border and just uh, takes a look at the real winning percentage of moves that were really played at that specific node. Of course, we can also encode um, expert knowledge into the Monte Carlo tree search, and there are two phases where we can do that. First is the selection phase, so where we select at which node do we want to play, which node do we want to try out, and therefore we can use patterns, we can use um, Atari solvers, and we can also use uh, Yosekis or opening libraries. And the second is the playout policy, so our random simulation. We can also use patterns there to try and make the playouts not purely random, but uh, more realistic to get a better value out of them. And this is very dangerous, um, especially if you use it with all moves as first, which almost every engine does. I think every engine does, every good engine at least. Um, mine doesn't do yet, but we get into that. <laughs> um, it is dangerous because then it's not purely random anymore and you could get like false positives and false negatives when you update the tree. So you gotta be very cautious with that and it is an improvement science that if you do a heavy playout that biases uh, or a selection or a playout that biases the tree too much, your problem actually gets worse although you add uh, knowledge. And, but nevertheless, all strong programs these days uh, do these so-called heavy playouts and so they're only doing 5,000 playouts uh, because the heavy playouts, of course, take more time to calculate. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say before, in the match between Franz Josef Dickert and Zen, Zen played, I think, on a cluster that had 80 cores in total and like 60 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so it's also a pretty high computing thing. So this uh, gets us to that thing that I was mentioning that probably some of you saw at Hacker News. It's uh, playing Go against the deep neural network and this uh, side was done by the author of this paper, um, which they took a deep convoluted neural network. I don't really know much about like what that really is, uh, to be honest. Uh, but they trained it with uh, professional games. Um, and they managed a prediction rate of the professional moves on their training set that had a value of, I think, 44% um, in total. So it's very good at predicting uh, professional moves. And this paper, um, it was also referencing this paper. Uh, this paper is from 2014, and they did about the same thing with a 12-layer uh, convolutional uh, neural network, and they managed a prediction rate of 51% uh, in there as well. 
And which is great. Like this approach has been tried before and it's only like this paper is to my knowledge the first one that made it useful because before I think it was tried in 2007, 2009, was always deemed not useful at the time. And it's a great success. It's one of the newest things uh, in Computer Go. But uh, these engines have a big problem. They only know what professional moves are and how professionals react. So if you play moves like trick moves or very bad moves, sometimes they react really badly because they're not used to what you're doing there. And so you can also get them into complicated fights and not like uh, professional uh, fights. And they will play very, very badly. And if you've seen the keynote on the first day uh, by Karina, um, that's also what like all their machine learning hours and their their fuck-ups uh, were in those algorithms then because then they fuck up badly and that is also uh, reflected here. So the strange uh, varies badly between those. But uh, what's even, what's really great about this is we can, we can include this into Monte Carlo Tutor. So these, these are pretty strong, but they still lose against strong uh, Monte Carlo bots. So against for Ego, which is about a one darn strength uh, bot, um, the bot from the other convolution network bot lost 86% uh, of the time. So they're not better than Monte Carlo bots. But we can incorporate uh, the neural networks into um, our Monte Carlo bots. And we do that at the selection phase. So we don't have much computing power left because we're always using all our cores and everything to do the simulations and the tree updates and everything. But we have a little nice thing in our computer that's a graphics card. So what uh, we can do to incorporate that is to asynchronously push the computation of uh, the recommendations uh, of, the, uh, of the neural network to our graphics cards, let it compute those computations, and then bring them back and incorporate them into our selection so that we try to play the moves that the network proposes to us first. And for me, that's kind of crazy. You, know, you use all of our cores, you use the graphics card, you use tons of memory, and I hope you have a good uh, cooler um, in there. So um, this uh, basically bumps the strength. I think Aya implemented it, and just by adding convolutional uh, neural networks, it bumped its, rate, its rating on KGS by one down from like three down to four down. So it's, it's pretty cool, and it's a cool area of research. So uh, that Facebook thing uh, that they made sort of a buzz around, um, uh, we think we found their bot on KGS playing, and it plays around the level of uh, 4Q or something. And in the video that they showed where they totally bet another engine, they just bet GNUGO at a very low level. So it's not much uh, to be excited about yet. But uh, interesting to see what they come up uh, with and if they, at some point, going to share their findings with uh, Computer Go and the Computer Go mailing list. That would be nice of them. Oh, yeah, there's a, if you're interested in this thing, there's a very cool Computer Go mailing list where uh, all the authors of the popular programs are there and they share and you can ask and you sometimes see me asking silly questions or good questions uh, depending on my mood. Um, so, uh, of course, I wrote a Go engine in Ruby, which is called Rubicon. You can find it at github.com, practop, uh, Rubicon. And you can also do gem install uh, Rubicon. Um, and then you can invoke Rubicon to play a little game in the CLI. Um, it just implements Monte Carlo Tree Search yet. There's still lots of performance optimization um, potential uh, for me to do uh, the move generation and the scoring faster, but I'm onto it. Um, I also have another project, which is Webco, which of course looks beautiful, um, which um, we implemented the whole thing in CoffeeScript and using web workers to outsource uh, the work, but I still have to do some work on that. Another thing that you might want to look at a much better engine is uh, Michi. Uh, from, uh, it's a Python engine that is in like uh, 500 lines of Python, and it is very readable. It's all just one file, but it's like a minimalistic uh, Go engine. I take lots of inspiration um, from there. And, uh, for those of you that are into Rust, because Rust is a cool thing to be in, um, there's also a nice uh, Rust engine, um, who also is also a German. So now in the end, let's see how much time do I have left. Ooh, damn it. OK, what have I learned? Real quickly. So uh, there's a huge difference between uh, making X faster and doing less of X. And all the time, we just try to make something really fast and not go the road of doing less of it, programming Ruby. Uh, doing less of things costs nothing, and so it's the route I went lots of times. Um, modelizing small components. Uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search is completely independent of the game of Go, and so mine is as well. You can plug in any game into my Monte Carlo Tree Search um, library, and it will play it uh, if you have a facade class to get into there. 
and benchmark everything, and there's a huge difference between solving things. We always try to solve problems the human way and not uh, the computer way, which is what we should actually be doing most of the time, as I try to uh, show you with the Monte Carlo research. And then, of course, I recommend everyone the jar of creation, like seeing an engine that you built yourself, and then you say, oh, it made that move, that's cute, or it made that move, that's actually pretty good, and pretty fighting spirit. So um, thank you for talking to you. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me ramble for so long. This talk was beating go thanks to the PowerPoint and this unpracked up. Thanks.